Wow, welcome. We're getting ready for the fourth talk in the geology lecture series this year, and it's hard to believe we're already into February of 2022. I want to tell you a little bit about the upcoming talks. I gave you a little hint at the Cascadia anniversary talk that we had some things in the work works and we just finalized the American Geophysical Union has started a new distinguished lecture series with uh, their College of Fellows. And so on Tuesday, March 8th, same time, 7 p.m. And again, only on live stream, we've got to got Dr. Tong Zhu from Peking University in Beijing, and he's going to talk to us about the health effects of air pollution. Why do we care? Definitely a pertinent topic. Uh, spring term, live or live stream, the continuing question, and my crystal ball is broken, so uh, hopefully we'll be in the hail center come spring, but if not, we'll definitely be here uh, by a live stream. And so the first spring talk or series of talks really is about Alaka, the sea otter. And so this is going to be a conference honoring the life and legacy of Chief Don Ivey, my good buddy. And these are going to look at a bunch of talks looking at the relationship between Alaka and sense of place on Oregon's south coast. It's going to be Saturday, April 16th from 1 to 4 p.m. We've got a great speakers list already set, and we're hoping to add to that a little bit more. We have Dr. Bobby Hall uh, from OSU. She is emeritus. She did a lot of early work with Don and the Coquel tribe in archaeology. We have Bob Bailey from the Alaka Alliance, Lauren Davis, uh, who spoke here several years ago from Oregon. Oregon State. He also did, uh, has been doing a lot of archaeology on the South Coast, also working closely with the Coquel tribe. Uh, this past summer, he and a group of his students uh, had a site going at Devil's Kitchen in Bandon, for example. Uh, Bill Robbins is going to be here. Um, Hard Times in Paradise about Coos Bay, uh, author and historian. Uh, we're going to be looking at the history of Alaka, Native American history, and again, a sense of place re re revolving around Oregon's south coast. Our final talk in the series this year uh, is by yours truly. It's going to be Saturday, May 21st at 7 p.m. Again, either we'll be in the Hale Center or we'll be on live stream from Oribatted Mites to Conodonts and beyond. So, I don't usually take the stage, but I decided in these strange times, it was about time for me to talk about some of the stuff that I've looked into over the years. So Dr. Sean Davis is our speaker tonight. And it was about two years ago, we had Sean all set up to come out here and talk about what he's talking about this evening. And you all know what happened then. We were set to host and then, well, we didn't. Winter 22, though, Sean is back, and the three speakers during winter term, you know, they might not have been able to talk in the series if we uh, were running live and they had to come here. So if there's a slight silver lining in the moment, that might be it. So Sean attended the University of Tulsa for his BS, and that's where he met uh, one of my colleagues, our physics instructor, Aaron Coiner, uh, and then Sean moved on to the University of Colorado to earn his PhD. He currently is a research scientist with the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And I have to admit, a little bit of me it must say that I'm glad we're doing this tonight. We missed a potential government shutdown window. Been there, done that. Glad that that's not part of tonight's uh, conundrums. Uh, Sean's research focuses on understanding interactions between changes in atmospheric composition and circulation with a particular focus on the upper troposphere to stratosphere. Tonight, he may include a couple of the projects he's affiliated with from swoosh to spark. Sean is planning to give us a little more background to start the talk. So without further ado, and one more point, you do have a chat box. So if you've got any questions for Sean, please put them in there and we'll get to those at the end of the talk tonight. Anyway, it's my pleasure to introduce to you this evening, Dr. Sean Davis with lessons at the School of Hard Knocks from the ozone hole to global climate change. Sean. 
Thank you, Ron. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. And uh, as Ron mentioned, I am a research scientist at uh, NOAA's Chemical Sciences Laboratory, uh, coming to you from Boulder, Colorado. And I thought I would take the opportunity to uh, introduce myself a little bit since I'm not able to be there in person. Um, I'll have to say up front that um, throughout my life, I have never lived close to the ocean and I am quite jealous of people who have that opportunity. So if you're tuning in from Oregon, uh, count yourself lucky. Um, that said, a, a uh, close second or maybe even a first above being near the ocean is being near the mountains, which I am, which I quite enjoy. Um, I grew up in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, as um, Ron mentioned earlier, I also uh, went to the university there. And uh, as many uh, people from Oklahoma end up being, I uh, had a keen interest in weather uh, from an early age, uh, which is uh, pretty common when you live in Tornado Alley. It's hard to ignore the weather there. And uh, when I was uh, uh, pursuing my uh, studies in physics, I um, had a really wonderful opportunity to do an internship at the Los Alamos National Lab uh, in New Mexico, which many of you probably, uh, you might have heard of the Manhattan Project uh, back in the 40s when the US uh, created the first uh, atomic weapon that was done at Los Alamos and what it's famous for. But uh, these days it's a, a world-class scientific uh, research facility and um, it turns out people study the atmosphere there. And I ended up working in a group uh, studying lightning um, and that was really my first exposure to the atmosphere and got me interested in the topic and ultimately led me uh, to uh, pursue a degree in atmospheric science uh, at the University of Colorado, which is a um, picture of, of uh, Boulder is shown here in the upper left. And uh, when I was there, I um, studied uh, cirrus clouds, actually, which are shown in this picture, which uh, many people are familiar with these wispy things that uh, play a role in climate. And uh, it, through that work, I, I worked on an instrument that flew aboard one of NASA's high altitude research aircraft uh, called the B-57, which is a special plane uh, that can fly very high up to about 65,000 feet and uh, make measurements in this uh, upper atmospheric region. And through that work, uh, my interests actually kept going higher and higher in the atmosphere and um, led me to where I have been now for a little over 10 years, which is at the NOAA Chemical Sciences Laboratory, uh, which is housed in this uh, building here uh, as one of four uh, NOAA labs that are in Boulder that are all in that building. And uh, it's a, a wonderful place to work right in the edge of the foothills to the Rocky Mountains. And my work here has been um, multifaceted, but, but a lot of it has focused on uh, using satellites that fly uh, in space and orbit the Earth to look down and study uh, the Earth's uh, atmosphere, and particularly uh, studying the stratosphere. Now, um, I know many people here probably don't have a uh, meteorological background, but ha may have heard of the stratosphere. And so just to try to get everyone on the same page, I want to um, um, define some of the common things I'm going to be talking about here today. So uh, the stratosphere is the layer of the atmosphere that is above the troposphere, where we live and where all the weather we experience occurs. And um, stratos, as uh, as its name implies, is a stratified part of the atmosphere. And one of the key things about the stratosphere is that uh, unlike the troposphere where we live, where the temperature gets colder as you go up in the stratosphere, it turns around and the temperature starts to get warmer as you go higher. And that actually turns out to be due in large part to uh, the ozone layer, which is really going to be the focus of my talk tonight. And uh, I know many people here um, have probably heard of the ozone layer. You've probably also heard of ozone pollution. And um, hopefully, I hope, I hope that you all have uh, good air quality there. But 
Um, ozone is often associated with uh, air pollution. And I think, uh, as Ron mentioned, one of your speakers upcoming in your series is actually going to talk about air pollution, um, which should be very interesting. But uh, for the purposes of this talk, I just want to be very clear that I'm not talking about the ozone pollution that occurs at ground level and that can uh, affect uh, human health uh, through breathing. I'm talking about the ozone high up in the stratosphere, so not the stuff that comes uh, from factories or tailpipes uh, from your car. And a good way to remember this uh, is um, uh, that uh, there's good ozone and bad ozone. Uh, so ozone up high is good and ozone nearby is bad. Okay, so, um, but what what is ozone? So ozone is really just simply um, three oxygen atoms uh, linked together. So the oxygen we breathe is molecular oxygen or O2 and ozone is simply uh, O3. And so whoop, this is a... Uh, schematic showing the, oh, I think I may have lost my slide here. I'm going to try this again. Hopefully that is back and happy. So uh, ozone is three oxygen atoms that are linked together. And uh, this uh, photo was actually taken um, by a friend of mine who does um, ozone measurements from balloons uh, that get launched from uh, near Boulder. And this is actually a picture of uh, the Boulder Front Range uh, mountains. And uh, I live somewhere down there and um, this uh, you can actually kind of see uh, some of the light reflected off the ozone layer in this picture now the ozone layer is extremely important uh, to life on earth and uh, to human health and the ozone layer is very quite simply uh, the sunscreen for earth so uh, the sun's um, rays that come to Earth have a very large amount of harmful ultraviolet radiation. And this thin layer of ozone in the stratosphere uh, filters out more than 90% of the harmful ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun. And it actually ultimately allows life to survive on the surface of the Earth. It and it's really amazing to think that uh, this this little, this very thin layer, it's this shell of ozone that's above us between about 10 and 20 miles high. Um, if you condensed it down to the surface of the earth, it would only be about an eighth of an inch thick or about uh, two pennies thick. Uh, it's a very fragile thin layer and um, it does an amazing amount of work for being a, a very small amount. Now, um, as I mentioned, uh, there still is some UV that gets down to the surface of the earth, and that can give you um, skin cancer or uh, cataracts uh, if you have too much exposure to it. It can also impact uh, your immune system, uh, both of, of uh, humans and animals. And in cases where um, plants are exposed to excess UV, it can actually damage crops. So uh, if you thinned the ozone layer, and had more UV coming down to the surface of the earth, it would actually damage uh, food crops that we make. And so uh, this is obviously something that is very uh, of very uh, great concern to humanity. And if you're about uh, my age or a little bit older, you probably remember uh, back in the 1980s, a fairly uh, significant concern over um, hairspray and aerosol cans, aerosol spray cans. Now, it turns out, um, you know, when I was a kid, this stuff was going on. I don't 
I didn't ever really understand what this was about. And it wasn't until more recently in my life that I've actually started to understand uh, what all the fuss about uh, was about in the 1980s uh, with regard to, to spray cans. And it turns out that these uh, spray cans, the propellant used in them was uh, composed of a chemical called CFCs or chlorofluorocarbons. And that that chemical was damaging to the ozone layer. And so uh, the story that I want to tell today is partly a story of um, CFCs going back in time and how they um, uh, were developed and what ended up happening and how uh, scientists realized that these were an environmental problem. So going back now, uh, our story really goes back to the 1920s. And ironically, it was actually human safety that uh, propelled the invention of CFCs in the first place. They were originally uh, invented uh, for use as refrigerants. And what you have to understand about refrigerants was that at the time in the 1920s, in the early days of refrigeration, uh, the, the refrigerant chemicals that they used were highly toxic and or uh, flammable. So a refrigerator or something uh, where, you know, these early refrigerators used chemicals like ammonia, propane, sulfur dioxide, methyl chloride. These things are um, not good to breathe. And in fact, the very few people, the people who are lucky enough to have refrigerators back during this time, typically would actually keep them outside uh, because if they sprung a leak in your house, uh, they could kill you. It's really that simple. And so there was a very good motivation uh, from a human safety standpoint uh, to come up with uh, safer alternatives to these um, toxic chemicals for refrigerants. So uh, in uh, 1929, uh, a man named Thomas Midgley, uh, who was an engineer, chemist, inventor, uh, came up with uh, CFCs uh, for use as a refrigerant. And he worked for the Frigidaire Corporate uh, Division of General Motors. So there was an interest here in refrigerators and ultimately um, in air conditioning. Uh, so this was a really remarkable invention and uh, Midgley was quite the showman. And so uh, I've included this picture here on the right, which I find really fascinating. So after he invented the substance, this magic substance, CFCs, that was non-toxic and non-flammable, he actually would demonstrate it. And this is actually at a conference uh, of the American Chemical Society, the scientific conference. He uh, takes a straw and inhales CFCs into his mouth and then uses them to uh, blow out a candle to demonstrate that these compounds were both uh, not toxic and not flammable. So it's really kind of amazing uh, demonstration that, that really wowed people that he had this wonderful invention. Now, as I've already kind of hinted at, these CFCs turn out to be a problem. And um, looking back now, uh, Thomas Midgley actually um, invented another uh, well-known environmentally uh, destructive substance, which is uh, ethyl lead or leaded gasoline, um, which is amazing that one person invented both CFCs and leaded gasoline. And it's actually earned him a lot of scorn from uh, current uh, publications, things like popular science saying, Thomas Midgley Jr. may have been the most environmentally disastrous person of all time, or CFCs being included on the Times 50 worst inventions list up there with things like Crocs in Agent Orange or Venetian blind sunglasses or Segways. Um, in all serious seriousness, uh, I think some of this criticism is uh, unfair to him, uh, certainly with regard to CFCs, because the um, problems were really not known at the times. 
at the time. And, and actually, um, it was a long time before anyone knew there was anything wrong with CFCs. So uh, what, did, what were CFCs used for? So it turns out um, that in addition to being a refrigerant or being uh, having use as in air conditioning, uh, these CFCs were also um, used as propellants for spray cans. And some of the earliest uses were actually by the US military in World War II uh, for uh, uh, insecticide uh, spraying to, to protect the troops from mosquitoes in uh, the various theaters of the war. Um, I should also mention CFCs um, were known uh, by their trade name often as Freon. So many people may have heard the word Freon and not CFCs. Um, later on, uh, people came up with uses for CFCs as a propellant to blow foam. And that included uh, foams that are blown for insulation in houses uh, and also foam, things like styrofoam. So the Big Mac is kind of the iconic example uh, of uh, a product that's produced using CFCs. Oh, I also do want to go back and make one comment on the leaded gasoline. My title of the talk, Lessons at the School of Hard Knocks, was actually uh, motivated by partially by Midgley's invention of leaded gasoline. So uh, I like cars. Anyone who likes cars knows uh, that what knock is and uh, knock is a bad thing in an engine. And at in the early days in the 20s, uh, in, internal combustion engines uh, had problems with knock and, and industry was trying to figure out how to keep engines from knocking. And uh, so leaded gasoline was actually an early solution to preventing engine knock. And, and I think the, the school of hard knocks is kind of uh, emblematic of these inventions where we invent something new and we don't realize that there is some unintended consequence of it. And it's only later that we learn that consequence. And we began to learn that consequence actually in the early 1970s. And so there was a uh, famous uh, inventor and atmospheric scientist named uh, James Lovelock uh, uh, from England who uh, invented uh, a thing called the electron capture device for a gas chromatograph. And he um, used his new invention for measuring chemicals in the atmosphere uh, to actually measure CFCs in the atmosphere. And uh, it was really very much a, a very fundamental scientific measurement. He was trying to learn about the atmosphere. Um, there was no real uh, applied aspect to this. And he took, he went out on this boat and sailed from England down to Antarctica, making measurements as he went. And he realized that everywhere he went, there were CFCs in the atmosphere. And this actually makes sense because um, CFCs are very stable. The very thing that makes them safe in terms of uh, breathing them in, for example, or, or not being toxic to you, is that they're non-reactive. And that non-reactive nature of them also means that they live in the atmosphere for a very long time. And so he was going around the world making these measurements. Um, he thought it was really interesting because it could tell you something about how the air in Earth moves from one hemisphere, from the northern hemisphere, where all these CFCs were being emitted by all the rich countries like in Europe and the US, uh, down to the southern hemisphere, where there were very relatively few um, emissions of CFCs. Um, and in fact, in his uh, paper in 1971, I've highlighted it here. He says the presence of stable sulfur and carbon fluorides in the atmosphere is not in any sense a hazard, um, which is a very for foreboding language that was um, quickly, uh, people began to realize that this was a problem. So around the time that Lovelock was making these measurements uh, in the early 70s, a, a Dutch scientist by the name of Paul Crutzen uh, was um, learning, he was trying to understand the ozone layer and, and what 
how the ozone layer was naturally formed and maintained. And in the process of, of trying to understand that, um, he and another scientist named Harold Johnson um, developed this idea of catalytic ozone destruction. And I promise I won't go too much into chemistry in this talk. And I think this is the only um, set of chemical reactions I have in this talk, but, but there is an important idea here uh, that, that is very relevant for ozone, which is that some types of chemicals can uh, destroy ozone in what's known as a catalytic cycle. And so in this case, uh, he was, Crutzen was really focused on nitrogen oxide. So nit nitric oxide here um, and, and that can, and NO2 can react with ozone in this series of reactions. And the net effect of the reaction is to destroy ozone. So you start with some ozone O3 and it ends up going to molecular oxygen. So these things um, can destroy ozone and more importantly, they don't get destroyed in the process. And so at the end of this reaction, you still have NO and it can just keep going around and around and eating more ozone. And so uh, this was a really important insight that he had into this category of chemical processes where you can have a compound come in and then act to destroy ozone and just keep going and keep going. Now, the things he was thinking about were um, related to nitrogen oxides uh, from soil. So natural things, soils emit uh, nitrous oxide, which is this N2O down here. Um, and, and as the N2O, as the nitrous oxide gets into the stratosphere, it can decay and um, let go and become NO, which can then participate in these reactions. Um, and he was thinking about things like if we used a lot more fertilizer in agriculture, would we emit more nitrous oxide and how would that affect the ozone layer? He was also starting to think about uh, the um, fleet of supersonic transport uh, that was starting to be um, thought about by industry in the early 70s. So uh, the Concorde airplane, which is shown here, uh, which flies at supersonic speeds and it flies in the stratosphere, it can get you from Paris to New York in like three and a half hours, right? Um, really, really wild technology that was being considered. And um, he realized that these planes were going to be flying in the stratosphere right near the ozone layer and emitting um, nitrogen oxides in a place where they could potentially destroy ozone. So he wasn't thinking about CFCs at all, but he was doing this catalytic ozone uh, chemistry, which was turned out to be very important. Um, a few years later, a young uh, postdoc from Mexico named Mario Molina and his advisor, Professor Sherry Rowland at the University of California, Irvine, um, were starting to think about CFCs and they were actually interested in uh, some of the measurements from James Lovelock that I mentioned earlier that showed that CFCs were in the atmosphere and that they were long lived. And they were actually thinking about this from the standpoint of, well, what ultimately happens to these things? You know, you put these things up and they last forever. How do they, do they eventually fall, get out of the atmosphere somehow? Where do they go? Um, and what they found ultimately was that as the CFCs got up into the stratosphere, they could actually um, break down because when you go high up in the atmosphere, as you get kind of near the top of the ozone layer, a lot of that ultraviolet light that I mentioned earlier uh, is very intense. There's a lot more of it. And that can actually break down the chlorofluorocarbons and release the chlorine. And that chlorine can then go on and participate in these catalytic reactions that destroy ozone that I was mentioning. So they sort of took the measurements of James Lovelock about the CFCs and some of the insights of Paul Crutzen about catalytic ozone chemistry and put them together and realize that CFCs could break down and that they could actually destroy the ozone layer. And uh, this finding led to really significant public concern. It led to uh, 
uh, Sherry Rowland and Mario Molina actually um, speaking out quite vociferously, um, kind of ringing the alarm bell that that these things could be a problem. Um, and it led to ultimately to to a large public reaction. Um, there were actually uh, campaigns by various environmental groups who are really uh, active at that time, uh, trying to uh, ban the use of CFCs, trying to um, prevent the use in spray cans. And actually in um, the US, uh, the US was sort of a leader in actually trying to reduce the use of CFCs in the 70s and actually banned ozone and spray can, or uh, CFCs in spray cans. Um, and I should mention, spray cans got a lot of attention uh, because unlike something like a refrigerator or your car's AC, spray cans are designed to emit all of the CFC that's in them into the atmosphere immediately. So the amount of CFCs that you could put into the atmosphere is a lot greater from something like a spray can that's designed to be released, whereas something like a refrigerator, all the refrigerant, all the CFCs are in there. They don't come out unless there's a leak. Um, and so so this was kind of a target of, of uh, environmental activists uh, who pushed for these things to be banned. And, and you know, this issue kind of simmered through the 70s, through the late 70s and into the early 80s. Um, but it wasn't really until 1985 that this problem rose to the level of, of a crisis in a lot of people's minds. Um, so if you go back to those early predictions from Molina and Roland, the types of ozone loss they were talking about was something like five or 10%, maybe over the course of a century or something like that. So it's, you know, a modest decline, it would be enough to be problematic, but not necessarily catastrophic. And uh, in 1985, what happened was a group of uh, British scientists um, who are, are pictured here were measuring ozone over Antarctica, one of the British uh, Antarctic bases. And they were finding huge losses of ozone like 40% loss since the 1960s. And, and that this loss occurred seasonally over Antarctica during certain times of year. And this was totally shocking. People did not expect this. They had no idea. And this was kind of sky falling, hair on fire uh, worry that they had. And um, they didn't really know that it was CFCs, but it was a very scary finding. And there was a very, at least plausible uh, idea that CFCs could be involved. This measurement, these measurements were so shocking that the scientists themselves didn't even believe them at first. They actually uh, sat on their results for a year and came back the next year with their, their instrument and actually tried out a different instrument and tried out a different instrument at a different base. and they finally got the courage to publish after they couldn't figure out anything wrong. Um, one of the, the kind of interesting stories of this time is that they knew that the NASA uh, satellite program had launched satellites that were supposed to be measuring ozone. And NASA hadn't said anything about any hole of, or loss of ozone over Antarctica. And uh, it turned out that the hole was so dramatic and so different than um, what the, the algorithms in the satellite uh, expected that the satellite processing was actually ignoring the data. It was basically treating it, they thought it was bad data because it was so far out of bounds of what they expected. Um, once they published their results though, uh, the people at NASA went back and looked at their satellite data and realized, oh yeah, actually there is something going on here. And so uh, this uh, satellite that NASA had up uh, was able to go back and measure um, the thickness of the uh, ozone layer over Antarctica. The satellite started in 1979 and 
from 1979 even to 1984, it could see this huge drop in the amount of ozone occurring over Antarctica. Now, as I said, this was really scary. People had some ideas that maybe this could be due to CFCs, but they weren't really sure. And so uh, this caused a lot of scientific interest and a lot of um, the, the older colleagues that I work with at NOAA were on the ground floor trying to figure out this problem and, and really figure out if it was something that was occurring naturally or was caused by human activities. And so in 1986, um, a scientist in our lab at NOAA uh, named Susan Solomon uh, led the U.S. Antarctic expedition uh, down to Antarctica to go um, measure and try to understand what was happening over Antarctica. Why was this happening in Antarctica and not elsewhere? And um, what she found ultimately came down to understanding uh, that Yes, it was chlorine, and it was actually happening in Antarctica because of a very specific thing that happens in Antarctica, in Antarctica, and uh, almost nowhere else, which is that there are these special category of polar stratosphere clouds that occur, clouds that occur in the stratosphere, uh, which are pictured here, and produce these beautiful, beautiful. Um, sort of pearly uh, optical effects uh, in, in sunlight, these clouds actually uh, serve as sites for surface reactions on the cloud particles themselves uh, that allow chlorine um, to be uh, liberated and come out where it can participate in these catalytic reactions. And so uh, this team uh, led by Susan Solomon uh, went down and made these measurements and really like pretty definitively showed that chlorine was playing a role here. Um, they didn't have all the pieces. They didn't have all the measurements they needed to fully dot all the I's and cross the T's, but they, they really um, figured this all out. And actually um, this was a really important finding. Uh, and I'm, I'm, very fortunate to to say Susan was uh, my boss for um, a good chunk of my tenure here at NOAA, and she's since retired and um, is uh, now actually a professor at MIT and doing really great work still on this issue. But her work at the time uh, was really revolutionary in, in explaining the Antarctic ozone hole, even if it didn't uh, answer all the questions. But even in this face of uncertainty, uh, the world was ready to act. And um, so in 1987, the uh, world came together and uh, enacted a treaty called the Montreal Protocol. And uh, this was a treaty that was negotiated um, through the UN. And its main uh, task was to phase out the production of ozone depleting substances. And uh, it was a quite um, unique treaty in that it uh, actually had enforceable mechanisms to, to um, really uh, phase out these substances, but it also set up a very, uh, I think, important and relevant uh, set of kind of feedback loops of information between science and technology and policymakers. And so uh, it actually set up a system as part of the treaty where every certain years, uh, the scientists would come together and say, this is what we know about uh, ozone. Um, and this is what happened. This is what will happen if you reduce CFCs by a certain amount. It also had a technology panel, which is actually very important that actually interfaced between uh, industry and the scientists. So, there was a feedback loop where industry could say, okay, we're, we're looking at these new compounds that could replace CFCs. How will that impact the ozone layer if we switch to those and how fast we switch to them? So the, it really set up this um, very uh, practical framework for uh, figuring out how to move away from these ozone depleting substances to safer 
uh, alternatives. And so um, the original Montreal Protocol uh, had uh, just a, ver a fairly gentle phase out of ozone depleting substances, but it actually turned out that the technology for changing these substances was not um, quite as hard as uh, people feared early on. And so there were subsequent amendments to the Montreal Protocol uh, in later years that actually really put the, the teeth into it and uh, started ratcheting down the amount of ozone depleting substances in our atmosphere. Now, um, the result of all this is that uh, now the ozone uh, hole and the ozone layer are healing themselves. And so this plot on the left shows uh, uh, a, a measure of how much chlorine is in the atmosphere uh, called equivalent effective stratospheric chlorine. And the important part is that due to the Montreal Protocol, it peaked around in the late 1990s and um, the concentrations have become, begun to decay. And uh, along with that, the uh, amount of ozone in the ozone layer has reached its minimum also around the same time, around 2000, and is now uh, starting to recover. And we expect that the ozone layer will have returned um, to uh, pre-CFC uh, values uh, sometime around the middle of the century, in part depending on which uh, trajectory we go on uh, when it comes to climate change. And that's actually illustrated by these various lines here that show different possible scenarios for climate change in the future. Um, this uh, animation on the left shows the evolution of the ozone hole over Antarctica, which has also started to heal. And um, you can see as time goes along, this hole is getting larger and deeper, so the even less ozone in it. And uh, around the late uh, 90s, it starts to level off and uh, currently is holding steady and slowly starting to improve. Um, a lot of this slowness in the recovery is related to the fact that the CFCs live in the atmosphere for 50 to 100 years. And um, so that's why it's not an instantaneous uh, return to normal, but it is headed in that direction. Now, a number of people have considered uh, what happens when, uh, if we hadn't done the Montreal Protocol, and it actually turns out that uh, with if we hadn't done the Montreal Protocol, the ozone on Earth would have been dramatically reduced by even by now. And uh, we would be seeing tens of millions of new skin, additional new skin cancer cases per year. It would have been a truly dramatically different world that we would live in, um, in terms of being able to even go outside for long periods of time. Um, not to mention reduction in the uh, efficiency of agriculture which would have been a major issue. Okay, uh, so this was really an, a major environmental success story. The Montreal Protocol was the first universally ratified treaty. 197 nations, every single nation on earth has signed the Montreal Protocol. Um, and as a result of the recognition of um, CFCs as being a problem for the ozone layer, uh, this actually resulted in the first Nobel Prize given to the field of atmospheric science in 1995. And it was given to these three scientists uh, whose work I described uh, previously, Paul Crutzen, Mario Molina, and Sherry Rowland. Um, this is something that, that our field is, is quite proud of. Okay, so I've said a fair bit now about the ozone layer problem and Montreal Protocol. And I want to jump a little bit into climate change and uh, talk about a few of the similarities and differences uh, between the ozone problem and climate change. So what about climate change? OK, so I think there's a handful of fairly straightforward uh, factual statements about climate change. I think 
a lot of people know about this now, uh, but climate change is real. It's caused by us, by humans. Um, it is uh, serious and becoming dangerous now. Um, there are solutions um, and fewer emissions now will lead to uh, lesser consequences in the future. So those are all pretty um, straightforward statements. I think one of the things that I hope to convey to you here um, is these last two bullets, which is that uh, Montreal Protocol is actually helping to prevent climate change. And ozone, this ozone problem is not a perfect analog for climate change, but there are some similarities. So how is Montreal Proto Protocol preventing climate change? Well, it turns out that a lot of these gases, these ozone depleting gases, are also very potent greenhouse gases. So the original uh, CFCs that were regulated by the Montreal Protocol and the halons, these are chemicals that are used in uh, fire extinguishing, uh, fire suppression systems. These things were very, very strong greenhouse gas uh, emitters. So compared to CO2 on a molecule by molecule basis, one molecule of CO2 versus one molecule of CFC11, CFC11 is over 4,000 times uh, more potent as a greenhouse gas. It, it would warm 4,000 times as much as CO2. Some of these other things get up here around 10,000. So a lot of these gases were very strong greenhouse gases. So even though they're not putting as much into the atmosphere as CO2, they actually have a significant impact on global warming. And um, furthermore, the replacements. So as the Montreal Protocol is implemented, they got rid of the CFCs. They replaced them with HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons, uh, which are shown here in the bottom. And these gases, while they don't have, they don't deplete ozone, which is great, but a lot of them have huge global warming potential. They are, they're very uh, high in global warming potential. So the Montreal Protocol has now actually uh, started to phase these out under what's called the Kigali Amendment uh, that was signed uh, in the mid uh, 2010s, around 20, started around 2015. Um, and the idea is that the Montreal Protocol is moving in the direction of phasing out these gases in favor of gases that don't uh, uh, warm the planet as much. And in fact, uh, a very interesting website that I uh, would encourage everyone to check out, uh, drawdown.org is a group that is going through uh, the sources of climate uh, causing gases and emissions and is looking at ways that uh, these different sectors could be reduced uh, to address the emissions that cause global warming. And actually, if you look at, so the size of these circles shows uh, different things that could be done, uh, how big their footprint is right now. And so there are things like, uh, you know, energy efficiency and how we produce energy and food and agriculture and, um, you know, shifting to electrifying vehicles. And you'll notice there's this huge circle here that says address refrigerants. Um, it's bigger than electrifying the vehicle fleet. So this address refrigerants is basically the Kigali Amendment. It's if we take these refrigerants that have these huge global warming potentials and phase them out in favor of refrigerants that don't have this problem, uh, we can prevent global warming. And it's, it's actually been estimated that uh, compared to no Montreal Protocol, uh, the Montreal Protocol has saved, by 2050, the Mont Montreal Protocol will have saved about a degree Celsius of warming. And that's about out of maybe one and a half that we expect now. So it's a big chunk. Um, and there is still room uh, under the protocol to do more. So uh, this is, this is uh, something that is very relevant still, even though the ozone hole problem is solved, the Montreal Protocol is still very much uh, um, relevant to discussions of climate change. 
Okay, so uh, one more slide and then I'll wrap this up. The um, lessons for climate change uh, from the ozone problem. So one of the ways I think it's important to recognize that these are very different problems. So the ozone problem was caused by this uh, set of gases that were produced uh, by a handful of industries. And I don't want to minimize the work because it was actually very, very, very difficult work. But in the end, after all of this uh, work was done, it, it was actually not as difficult of a fix. It was more of a technological fix uh, of finding replacement gases for these. And in contrast, I think the causes of climate change are really multifaceted. Uh, they ultimately mostly come down to how we consume energy, but also how we use land. Um, so overall, I think most people recognize that climate change is a much uh, bigger issue than ozone, than the ozone issue. But never, nevertheless, there are some similarities. Uh, you know, in the ozone problem, as I hinted at, when the Montreal Protocol was made, there was action in the face of uncertainty. We didn't really know, we didn't have everything nailed down. Um, and I think now in the climate uh, world, we see the same thing. So um, despite any kind of uncertainty about what the future may bring, uh, that doesn't have to prevent uh, people from taking action to address the problem. Uh, similar to the ozone issue, um, or similar to the climate change issue, uh, in the case of ozone, it was really developed countries that caused the problem in the sense that uh, it was the developed world that was using these uh, CFCs and other uh, chemicals that were causing the ozone hole. And the Montreal Protocol had a very um, kind of ingenious way of helping developing nations avoid having to use uh, CFCs in their development and giving them an easier timeline. I think you see a lot of these types of discussions as they relate to climate change, uh, because in climate change, we know that the developed world has uh, used uh, fossil fuels and used uh, uh, energy sources um, that emit carbon in order to achieve the standard of life that we have. Um, and that developing nations want to catch up. And so uh, these same types of, of discussions, I think, are very uh, uh, relatable in both cases. Uh, for the case of ozone, uh, the ozone problem, I think it demonstrated that consumer pressure works. There was consumer pressure and companies really did respond to that. I think um, we're starting to see that some now with climate change. Um, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, would say the success of the ozone uh, could be kind of boiled down to a couple of things. Uh, I call this the three P's. I, I actually stole this from um, a colleague of mine. But um, the three P's being personal, perceptible, and practical solutions. So with the ozone uh, case, it was personal. There was a personal link. If the ozone layer goes away, I'm going to get sunburned. I'm going to get skin cancer. I'm going to get a cataract. It's easy for me to make that connection. Um, especially with the discovery of the Antarctic ozone hole, the problem was perceptible. So people could really see. It's very easy, very visceral to see the hole over the Antarctic uh, and be concerned. And then the, the solutions ended up being pretty practical. Um, and I think that these three P's, in my, in my observation, they seem to be starting to happen now with climate change. I think people, um, unlike a decade ago, or maybe two decades ago, uh, people are starting to see the problem as a personal problem that affects them. They're starting to see things that in their daily lives, whether that is uh, flooding or sea level rise, coastal erosion, um, increased wildfire activity, people are seeing those kind of things. They're perceiving them as being related to climate change. And um, I think in terms of practical solutions, uh, 
obviously we're not there yet, but there are starting to be solutions uh, related to how we produce energy in different ways. Uh, that that people are starting to see that there is maybe a um, way that we can make energy that doesn't involve emitting carbon into the atmosphere. Okay, so I'll leave you with a couple of parting thoughts. Um, hopefully, if you take away anything um, from this talk, you'll take away that uh, the protection of the ozone layer is really an environmental success story. Um, the ozone layer is not a perfect analogy to climate change, but there are some overlaps. Uh, and in my view, you know, I think the way I like to think about this is that we will address climate change. Um, it's just a matter of how we're going to do it. And we're going to address it through mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. Um, and in this case, what I mean by mitigation is uh, mitigating or reducing the emissions of the chemicals that cause uh, warming through alternative energy, uh, for example, things like solar panels or onshore wind. Uh, we're also going to have climate change. We do have climate change already, and we're going to adapt. We're going to build higher seawalls. Um, we're going to have to harden our infrastructure uh, against fires and things like that. We're going to have to learn how to manage forests better um, and, and grow crops in a warmer climate. And finally, there's suffering. Um, the picture here on the right is from a friend of mine's house that burned down at the end of 2021 in the Marshall Fire, uh, which started a couple miles from my home here in Boulder and burned a thousand homes. Uh, after an unprecedentedly warm and dry uh, six months in the front range of Colorado. Uh, and I think that, you know, we are at a point where we're making choices that will determine how much of a mix of these three things uh, are going to be how we address climate change. Um, and so I would encourage people to think about this and think about uh, you know, how, how they want to fill those various buckets. Um, so that brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, if you're interested in this uh, topic, a very condensed version of this material uh, is available for viewing online in a TED talk that I gave a couple of years ago. Um, and I would encourage you to check it out and share it with your friends and family. Um, I think we have time for some questions. I am going to attempt to um, switch my screen and hopefully make this a little more interactive uh, part of the session here. Thank you, Sean. And I'm thinking that the website, and you can repeat this if I get it wrong, uh, go.ted.com forward slash your name, Sean Davis, correct? Yep, that is correct. Okay. Because part of that, you were covering it up with a little picture in the oh, bottom okay. corner. So I just want to make sure yeah. people, they probably would have been able to find it by Googling it, but just in case. Yeah. Um, and Dallas, let us know in, the, in our chat box if um, anybody has any questions that they're typing in. Uh, one thing that came across in a lot of this, hits me at kind of, I think, similar to you, and I'm probably a couple years older, um, spending a lot of time in the Adirondacks during acid rain, hiking in those crystalline ponds, uh, certainly uh, ozone hole and the consequences. And as you were going through that, I was in the back of my mind trying to place a timeline that I, I really didn't quite have, but I, I think it was probably post undergrad and getting into graduate school teaching uh, labs with those giant uh, lecture uh, classes at Iowa, where we'd have a variety of environmental geology, environmental science, intro geology, that, that those things were, um, were coming up. Uh, I was wondering with the tail, what's the residence time in the atmosphere for CFCs? I probably knew that 20 years ago. So yeah, see, 
the resonance time is different for each uh, chemical, but it's about somewhere around, around 50 years, 50 to 100 years. Um, a lot of the big ones are around 50. And so that is actually why, even though we've basically stopped emitting a lot of these CFCs, they still persist and we're still gonna have ozone holes and some ozone depletion uh, going forward. But as those things are slowly scrubbed out of the atmosphere, um, the ozone layer is coming back. And uh, the best estimates right now are that the ozone layer will be back to 1980s levels around 2040 to 2050. Um, so, you know, that's, that's really um, impressive and uh, actually, for some kind of <laughs> interesting um, science behind this, but the um, it's likely that the ozone layer will actually uh, in undergo what uh, is referred to as super recovery uh, in the later part of the century. And so uh, the CO2 um, that's emitted actually cools the upper stratosphere, and that actually changes the ozone chemistry in a way that increases ozone. And so uh, global warming is actually making the ozone layer get thicker just on its own. Um, and so as you reduce the CFCs and go back to that 1980s state, you're actually gonna keep, you're gonna kind of overshoot uh, in the future, um, which is kind of a, an interesting um, and maybe not super well-known fact about the ozone layer. So one of the, questions that I've been asking all the speakers since, especially since we, we've gone online. Uh, previously, occasionally we'd bring in community college students, K-12 students for uh, sort of a pre-talk in, in the afternoon. But I'm wondering if you were starting your education today, either, and you can kind of split that out in the K-12, uh, middle school, high school, or, or community college, what kind of things would you focus on? So you can think of class-wise or other items if you were still considering pursuing a STEM degree or career. And you could even lead into that if you wanted with what led you into a STEM career. Did you start that pathway pretty much right off the get-go or did you steer into it through a particular class or uh, something else? Yeah, you know, um, I think I... I always have loved math and science my whole life. Um, and so it was, it was a very easy transition for me because it was something that I knew I liked. Um, really, I knew in, funny enough, in high school, um, I had a wonderful physics teacher and fell in love with physics, loved astronomy. I, I absolutely worshiped Carl Sagan, you know, I read all his books and the cosmos and thought that was just the coolest stuff ever. Um, and so I think that's kind of what got me in the door. I, you know, once I was in college and I was studying physics and I knew I enjoyed learning about physics, but I, I honestly didn't really know what I wanted to do. I, I felt pretty open, you know, when I was looking to go to graduate school, I applied to like an optics program and a um, couple straight physics programs and a couple atmospheric science programs. And I really wasn't sure. I, that's actually part of the reason why I took a year off after undergrad to go uh, work for a while and think about it. And, and it was really at that time that I realized that I really enjoyed um, atmospheric science. I really enjoyed applied science more than really fundamental uh, basic science. Um, but yeah, in terms of, of kind of advice I would give, you know, one thing that, um, I mean, there's the very obvious things are like take science classes, take math classes, take computer science classes. Those are all, um, maybe, you know, predictable advice to give. And I would give those that advice for sure. Um, one thing that sticks in my head, you know, when I interviewed, uh, to join NOAA, um, the head of our group at, at the time was uh, Susan Solomon, who's a very famous scientist um, and a uh, very, very approachable person, but intimidating when you don't know her uh, and you only know her through her scientific reputation. 
And interestingly, when I talked to her for the first time, one of the things she was interested in, um, she asked to see a paper I had written and my thesis. She wanted to see my writing, which is really interesting because you think like, I'm going to go interview for a science job and someone's going to ask me to like bust out some equation or, or show how good I am at math or how quick I am at recalling some scientific fact. But actually, I think she had a very good insight that um, communication skills are extremely important and not just for giving lectures or teaching, which they are important for that too, but um, for communicating with your fellow scientists, with um, forming ideas, communicating them in a way that other people understand. You know, science gets very technical. And so sometimes it's just hard to describe your idea. Um, and so I would really encourage people to not discount uh, English <laughs> of all things, like learn how to write, think about how you write, think about how you communicate um, and, and don't poo poo that stuff just because it's not um, part of the STEM curriculum directly. Um, other than that, I think definitely for people who are coming through now, uh, even more so, you know, computer science stuff is really important. I wish I had had more of that, uh, more exposure to that um, and math. I think you just, you know, those skills to me seem so transferable that you're going to use them in any technical field that you're pursuing. And um, yeah, I think those are those are great skills to have. So, so I was thinking of the last couple of slides that you had and the little things that uh, we potentially can do. And it reminds me about 15 years ago, I had the sincere honor of hosting uh, Lonnie Thompson from Ohio State. And we had a conversation because back in the olden days when folks stayed at our house, uh, we had a conversation about, you recognize the irony that you flew from Ohio State to Oregon <laughs> And at least he doubled up. He did a, a session up at Oregon State University and then came down to the coast. But the carbon footprint of that loop to give two basically hour, maybe hour and a half each talks um, wasn't lost on me. And that's one we didn't archive, which I still, still feel bad. So one of the benefits is uh, with you and Boulder we saved a big carbon footprint by having you stay there. I'll say I truly appreciate uh, your time and willingness to participate in this. I'm really sorry that we didn't get to host you out here on the on the Oregon coast. Uh, weather has been scary fantastic, so the climate change component of the talk uh, definitely hit some chords because the last couple of weeks have been really different for january february right. but i right. appreciate you and all of the folks over the years that have made time in their schedules to participate in the lecture series out here and i don't see any other questions coming in so i'm gonna let you go have the rest of your night i appreciate all of you that have tuned in and hopefully we'll see you one month from tonight for dr tong Zhu from peking university uh, Tuesday, March 8th, 7 p.m. on live stream at the college website, you know it, www.socc.edu, the health effects of air pollution, why do we care? Uh, part of a new uh, College of Fellows Distinguished Lecture Series uh, put on by the American Geophysical Union. Uh, following that spring, whether it's live or live stream, on April 16th, 1 to 4 p.m., a uh, conference on a locker, sea otter, and its connection to native people on the South Coast and sense of place. And then wrapping up the year this year, Saturday, May 24th, 21st, years truly at 7 p.m. Uh, on a variety of topics. Till then, stay safe, take care, and look forward to seeing you hopefully in a month. Thank you. <laughs>